This is a Society of Creative Anachronisms uh, tournament combat crossbow, Ron, just in case you're like, what is that, Jim? I'm, I answer your question. Okay, so thanks for that uh, quick intro there, uh, Jim. So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, what was previously known as the Secure Developer uh, Podcast. We now have uh, a new name, a My Dev Set Ups, and we have information on our website about our rebrand, so you can head there to check out exactly what that means. Uh, my name is Oliver. I'm one of the community managers at Sneak, and we help uh, deliver these sessions every two weeks. And today we're joined by Jim Manico and Ron Paris, both from Manicode, who are going to talk us through building secure React applications. Um, we'd love your feedback as we go through this session as well. So we are currently uh, in our Slack and live sessions uh, channel. So as we get go through this session, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask them as we go through, and we will pass them on. To, to Jim and to Ron. And the Slack channel is actually the best place to interact with our speakers as well. So during the session, after the session as well. So you can feel free if you're listening to this uh, as a recording or any questions come, up, come to you afterwards, you can feel free to post those in the Slack community and we'll make sure that they get to, to Jim and to Ron. So once the session is over, the recording will be posted on our website, which you'll be able to check out um, at any time. And I think that's enough for me at this stage. So I'm gonna hand over to, to Jim and to Ron and they're gonna take us through uh, today's session. Hi everybody, my name is Jim Manico. I'm really happy to be here on this, not a podcast, not a webinar, live, it's a live session. Let's start with just getting that, let's get our terminology right. We're on a live session. Is it a virtual session or a virtual live session? I already so, mixed it up. <laughs> That's a good question. We call it a virtual session. Vir virtual wow, live session. I already, wow, I already, I'm just sorry. My marketing terminology is a bit off. It's a virtual virtual session and we virtual do have to session. be live, but we're, but we're live too. We're live right now, yeah. You know, it, it, it's it's my great pleasure to, to also introduce Ron Paris again. I've known Ron since 2013. We used to work together at White Hat Security, which is where we met back in the day. Ron is one of my favorite researchers in the application security space, specifically, and he does a lot, but specifically his work around JavaScript security is some of the best I've seen. And you know what? There's a lot of us who make a lot of noise in the industry, but it's often, I think, the folks behind the scenes really doing the hard work who are some of the really best contributors. And I, I see Ron as one of those people. How, how you doing, Ron? I'm doing well, Jim. That is true. We did meet in 2013 during our brief stint over at White Hat Security. Great company. Enjoyed that. A, that, was, was, that was when you were doing 200 OWASP meetings a year, right? Yeah, something like, it was a fascinating experience. A lot of travel. I, I did love the experience there. It, now that now that it's sold, my stock is cashed out. I can say it was a circus. Holy cow! No, I'm not part I of this. I can't say that. I'm not part of that. I was, You're not part yeah. of that comment. No, no, it's okay. Circuses are fun places, and a lot of like a lot of very skilled professionals are needed at the circus. So, <laughs> Ron, Ron Ron Paris does not endorse that comment. He does not endorse that comment. So, so when, did, when did we start talking about React security, Jim? I remember in 2015, you had already done some early research and maybe even provided some guidance to developers on, on how to get it right with React. 2015, there was not a lot of people talking about React security and it was beginning to grow exponentially in terms of use. So, and there was a few people chatting about it on Twitter and a few people posting blog posts and I, I was collecting the information from like seven or eight different people who posted little bits about it, collected it and began to add it to my courseware with references and began to, and I pushed out like a, a brief guide on React security back in 2015. And I know JavaScript, but I, I don't know JavaScript at the level of like closures and some of the more advanced techniques. I'm, I'm like one of your jQuery JavaScript guys, right? I spent years doing it. And so I remember when you looked at my research, and I, I and I, I, if I remember correctly, I, I hired you to like look at the research and extend it because I know yeah, that I think that was uh, November of 2017. Yes, I think you had given me your early research, and I looked it over, and it all looked like you know high quality stuff, good guidance. And I think what was happening around then was that most folks were still writing Angular, so Angular one was still very popular, and React was the challenger. And I think back in 2017, November, so two years ago, you pinged me and said, hey, would you mind for Manicode just doing a deep dive on the React security stuff? And then I think I spent the next six, eight months really digging in and figuring out what it takes to write a React application and take its threats and uh, attack surface into account. 
and and we were going to give a talk at at uh, at uh, AppSec DC. And when I saw your presentation, I was like, "Holy cow! You've taken this research to its like logical conclusion so far ahead that it's starting to get beyond my abilities." Like again, I, I did all my JavaScript development in an era where jQuery reigned supreme, and I wrote a lot of JavaScript, but that didn't require a lot of the advanced, powerful features of JavaScript that I think are now necessary in modern development. And this is where you jump in. This is where you took over and really extended that research to the max. I heard a lot of people comment on your DC talk and they were like, that was amazing. And there's like half the talk I didn't understand. So I think, and, 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 and let me explain why. It's not because it wasn't a good talk. It was because a lot of us in the security industry are thinking jQuery, are thinking jQuery level JavaScript. And there's not a lot of people that I know in the industry who really understand JavaScript at the level that's needed for like modern Node and modern React and Angular development. That's a that's a small number of people. So yeah, yeah. it's, it's definitely taken a so jump. And that JavaScript syntax. I mean, with the update in 2015 in particular, the JavaScript standard doubled in the number of language features. So the size of the standard, if you printed it out would be double in size. So a lot at that point, a lot of language features were introduced. And I feel like, you know, security pros and AppSec folks might not have had the time to dig in to those new features of JavaScript. But I think now here in 2019, I heard something like 70% of JavaScript developers use React currently in some yeah. capacity. So this, this library has really taken over. So I think it's good that we provide some guidance to folks writing React and also folks that are, you know, taking care of a React application from an AppSec point of view or just interested in maybe doing some automations around security. I agree. So this is a good time to talk about all this. Are um, we allowed to talk about your employer on this on this virtual session? Sure, yeah. No, I mean, I do training uh, with Manicode. I've been doing that for a few years and enjoying it. Do a little research for Manicode. Um, I'm currently working for NPM as a security engineer. So NPM, as some of you might know, uh, they, they have a lot of the world's JavaScript modules and those end up getting downloaded and used. And they also provide security tooling, such as NPM audit that will give you, I'll talk a little bit later about kind of how that fits in. Um, I know Sneak um, also has some tooling around the same kind of use cases plus more. Um, so I think we're both allies in this, you know, finding and reporting of vulnerabilities and helping people automate security. I, I agree. So my, my question for you is, is like, how many modules in NPM are React components. Like if I want to download a third party React component and use it within my React app, I know that React has this big third party library ecosystem. How many, like how many modules are in NPM that so I can let's, React? Good, Yeah, so like if like, you just take, let's like take one step. A couple yeah. hundred or so? Or? A few thousand. Okay, so let's take one step back. Why are, we, why are we writing React code, right? What's the primary task that React's helping us with? The primary task is it's going to do DOM updates. So state of our application changes on the front end, and we want to change the DOM to reflect that new state. And like you said, jQuery was often used for this in the past. You would use some jQuery code. If jQuery had a slogan, it would be find something and do something to it. So you just kind of always manipulating the DOM in different ways. But what React has is a unidirectional data flow model where updates happen in a very specific way. And from a security point of view, that's important because it means that if you use React correctly, you shouldn't have to think about security concerns every time you go to update a piece of the DOM. That hopefully React has some safeguards built in that will prevent you from kind of coming off the rails. So I remember when you pinged me back in 20, uh, 2017 about writing some research on React, I thought, isn't this a done deal? I mean, isn't this solved? What, what's there to talk about? And then when I dug in a little more into this ecosystem you're talking about, and it's 65,000 modules that I found on, uh, on, on the NPM uh, registry, I'd say that uh, it's not a solved problem for various reasons that we can kind of break those down. And, and, and just, to, just one little note, a lot of the use of jQuery in my era of development, we weren't doing asynchronous work with the, with the DOM. We were mostly making a page request, pulling down a page, and jQuery would let us manipulate the DOM, but not in an asynchronous way. It was more of like styling and some fancy components we couldn't get in basic forms, but it wasn't a lot of like live updating the DOM through like Ajax JSON round trips. That's not a lot of what jQuery was used for, at least in my era development. I know, and, and as that became in vogue in the last couple of years, jQuery, we're gonna break apart. It's not, I don't think it's the best library for that. And this is where the Angulars, the views, and of course the Reacts, real, I think shine the most is when you're building a complex UI with a lot of like Ajax live data updates, 
that's where you almost need something like React, I, I would dare say. Is that yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that you know, if we, if we take a step back and think about the security implications, you know, I remember watching some of the talks you gave, uh, you know, in 2013, 2012, and you talked a lot about cross-site scripting and, and defense and mitigation, and a lot of it was around uh, server-side rendered templates, right, and how to get it right. Uh, when you're pulling something out of the database and you're generating a page on the server side, you're about to send it over to the client. That was kind of the, the way that apps were being built back then. And React's part of this modern era where you get a big bundle of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and then the React code is responsible for making these, these requests asynchronously and pulling in whatever JSON and then redrawing parts of the DOM based on user interactions. So things have definitely shifted and, and that's changed the attack surface, right? That's a pretty big attack surface. You're now dealing with uh, dynamic data entering the DOM, you're doing live DOM updates, reacting to user events and more. And this really does change uh, how to deal with the main vulnerability we care about in this world is cross-site scripting. And so the, the, the advice we gave about cross-site scripting, even just a few years ago, even the DOM-based XSS advice we gave, it's a whole different ball of wax as we move into these modern frameworks. Now the knowledge to really build secure user interfaces has become specialized. You have to really understand React and DOM XSS and, and JavaScript to be able to build secure React applications. So in some ways, I think it's easier to build a secure user interface on the web. In some ways, it's a lot more specific and, and, and challenging in some ways, as we're going to talk about in this. Yeah, I think, not a, podcast, you know, not a webinar, but virtual session. During this virtual session, yeah, I remember when I was asked to do this research for Manico, the net result was that was a report that was uh, shared with corporations and uh, customers of Manico and partners. And I remember that they said that I had to have relevant research that showed vulnerabilities that were already found in the ecosystem. And then I could talk through example code. And I said, okay, no problem. I'll just go grab a few React vulns um, from the public database, you know, React component library vulns, and I'll analyze them and, you know, and jump in. But what I realized is that there weren't that many reported vulnerabilities. So you had 65,000 modules, but the number of reported vulnerabilities at that time, uh, we really only had one that I was able to point to in the NPM registry database. That's insane. That's completely yeah. insane. And you know, of course, the man who found it, um, Adam Baldwin, who's always five years ahead of everything. So he was already thinking about it and already moved on by the time the rest of us even knew this was going to be a problem with React security. But I went in and I found 66% um, of all the component library vulnerabilities in 2018. Um, how, I also, how, many, how many was that, may I ask? Don't steal my punchline. I okay. found 40%, I found all 40% of all React component library vulnerabilities since 2016. And I found 100%, according to the NPM database, of the cross-site scripting React component library vulnerabilities of all time. These are the component libraries, not, not the React you know, library itself. I'm with you. Um, and I, and to do that, I had to find a grand total of two vulnerabilities and publicly what? disclose them. So, so what, if I find- Wait, can, can, you, can you give me that, that whole, like, this, this, every time I hear this, I can feel my head wanting to explode. Can you sum this up one more time for me, please? I I'll make, make it sure. easier for you. So since, since there's 65,000 modules out there in the ecosystem, and according to NPM's advisories, there's only five known vulnerabilities in all of these libraries. And I went and looked at some of the 65,000 libraries as part of the research I did for Manicode, and I was just tripping over vulnerabilities. I mean, I was literally the first thing I opened, pop, five minutes in, here's a cross-site scripting. Open another library, 10 minutes in, boom, here's a cross-site scripting. So React component libraries often contain vulnerabilities. I think they're just not being audited. We don't have a lot of folks out there helping us look for vulnerabilities in these libraries. Hopefully this virtual session will spur some researchers who are interested in maybe getting a few CVEs on the resume or participating in uh, one of these bug bounty programs like the Node Foundation Ecosystem Workgroup runs a bounty. And if you find these vulnerabilities and report them, you know, you're, you might be eligible for, for a CVE, but then maybe even get some credit. Um, and potentially if it's a high download library, you, you, you could be eligible for bounty pay. So I would say that like your biggest concern when using React is probably the library itself. So does React, the library itself contain vulnerabilities? And in the history of the React library, it's only had three vulnerabilities. But that's, all, that's a pretty impressive. One was in 2013. Uh, it, was a, it was an attribute creation vulnerability. It was cross-site scripting via attribute creation. 
What? No, <laughs> when, every time you say uh -oh. I'm cryptic, I'm gonna raise my cross bow. So someone's like, last time I was on this virtual session, I threatened Simon, one of the lead Java guys there, with the with the machete throughout the podcast because he needed to be kept in line. You know, Oliver is very respectful, but I, I just I, I know these sneak guys, and I always got to bring a weapon with me, and so I brought crossbow to represent cross site scripting. So so, so Oliver. Keep in line is what I'm trying to say. Don't make me use this. And somebody asked me on the live session, are you bringing a knife? I'm like, I'm not going to bring a knife. That's terrible. I'm bringing a crossbow. This is my society of creative anachronism crossbow. Here you go, Ron. This is for you. Here you go. Whoa. Whoa, that's stuck into the wall. Oh, my God. Check this out. I'm is that an Airbnb? Air no, no, no. There, There is my cr I, I got to show you this because my girlfriend's going to kick my butt when she sees this. That That is what I just did. I just kind of... Shot at the wall. Oh wow! Let's go back to work, Ron. That, that's that's. This we were gonna... talking about something pretty exciting. I could tell Oliver wanted to know more about I these vaults in the uh, in the React luckily, in the React code base. Luckily, I'm renting. Let's move on, Ron. Let's move on. There was also a cross-site scripting vulnerability in the React library, and there was one in React DOM as well. So all three of the vulnerabilities in the React library itself have all been related to cross-site scripting, DOM-based cross-site scripting server-side rendered code uh, related cross-site scripting, and then DOM-based cross-site scripting. So I'd say that if you're using the React library, you probably just want to stay up to date. Um, and if there's a chance that there will be another cross-site scripting in the, in the React core library, but they don't happen very often. Now, when it comes to your code, like what can you do to avoid um, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities? I think maybe I could do a little bit of a screen share here and kind of show us a code sample while Jim does archery practice. Let me, uh... <laughs> I'm back, Ron, I'm back. I'll, okay. Virtual cool. session, cross-site scripting in React <laughs> ecosystem. I'm, I'm more focused now, I'm more focused. Okay. I'm gonna share. Yeah, I'm ready for, I'm ready for a sneak poster. No, Alfred, I'm probably gonna get like a contractor and get some, you gotta get some fixing there. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty big hole. I really didn't think through my crossbow demonstration because it's like a safety. It's a safety bolt, and it, it didn't it didn't provide the safety I was expecting. Very much like we see in the world of application security and modern frameworks, as we're about to talk about. That's really the the metaphor I'm trying to get across here. Wow. That's so a Oliver and Jim, can you see my screen? Do you see this built-in XSS defense slide? No, yes. I. How do I, why do I not, I just see Ron. How come I don't see it? I'm not sure. Do you see it, Oliver? Does it say building for XSS defense at the top? Yep, I can see your screen. What matters awesome is things. that, that's what matters. Let's do this. So here we have a React component and we're defining a new app component and it's got some markup here that kind of looks like HTML. Do you know what this stuff is, Jim? It looks like HTML, but it's inside of your JavaScript. Do you know what this is? Like this? Is he talking JSX or something or? Yeah, this is our JSX. Yeah, we got some JSX here. So JSX is a, sort of looks like a markup language that you author in your JavaScript files that gets transpiled to uh, JavaScript that'll run in the browser. So in this case, like these divs, this div with a, with a class name equal to app, that'll get transpiled under the hood to something like um, create element in the React library. And that class name will get passed in as part of an object and the property will be equal to the class name and then its value will be equal to that string. So while you're looking at it, it looks like HTML, this will actually get transpiled into something that runs uh, in your browser as JavaScript. And so, like I said, the primary thing that React does is it renders DOM. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna render a div and then in that div, it's gonna place some text content. Here, that text content looks again like some markup, but you can see it's in quotes and it, we intend as a programmer for it to be a string. Is this vulnerable to cross site scripting, Jim? This no this way. Code example. At, at, this is this is where JSX shines. This is where this is why a lot of React folks say that you can't have XSS in React is because whenever you're putting um, any kind of content between two mustaches, it's going to do contextual uh, contextual output escaping. It, like like you see in the bottom example, it's it, we're, we're converting like the less than symbol to the HTML entity ampersand lt semicolon, which means it's going to display the attack, going to display the markup or the JavaScript, but it's not going to execute it in the browser when it gets displayed. So this is the main defense when it comes to cross-site scripting, output escaping, 
and Ron, we, how long, we've talked about this for over a decade, maybe. We even have, like, and I, I just enjoy hearing you talk about it. I remember the first time I ever had to listen to, a, a, had to listen to a speech you were giving uh, at UCLA. Uh, they told me at Whitehead, they said, hey, you got to go meet Jim Manico. He's giving a speech and you've got to sit there and watch it. And then afterwards, you guys are taking a meeting together. And so I said, well, how long is the speech? And he says, it's going to be four hours long. <laughs> oh no, this is going to be the worst day of my life. He's going to be talking about things I already know for four hours. I sat in the audience. I didn't look at my watch once. So you talk about contextual escaping as much as you want, Jim. I'm very but honored. Glad very to hear you talk about it. No, and it's amazing. In the last couple of years, we've seen frameworks like, and some frameworks like old school Java, Java, Java server page, some of their default components will do some escaping. But in the modern era, we see things like Go templates, which does contextual output escaping, React and Angular and even Vue as modern JavaScript frameworks that do this escaping. So, and a lot of other modern template, even server side templates will do this stuff automatically. This is a big improvement in the world of XSS defense when building web user interfaces. But as you know, it's not, you know, even, just because you escape data in certain contexts doesn't mean you get perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this, I love this example because we have an example of we're putting untrusted data in a URL context. And even when it's escaped properly, a JavaScript URL is a common way to bypass this particular piece of code. And as a quick note, and please go back and re-explain this again, as a quick note, the, the Google researchers, like the people who write trusted types, Chris Kristoff and, um, and some of the other folks who are CSP. Is it Mike Samuel still working on the standard? Um, I, I think it's, it, Chris Kristoff is the lead guy with doing trusted types. And I'm not sure who's working on CSP. That's a W3C standard now. But I know that Michael Spagnolo and Lucas Weichelbaum from Google, they've pushed out several talks on how to implement CSP in the real world. And their data is some of the best I've ever seen. So I'm a big fan of these three. And I really think the leaders in this uh, of content security policy, I call it Lu Lucas Weichelbaum and Michael Spagnolo, top, top tier guys, because they're not just building the standard, they're deploying it everywhere and all these different properties and understand the nuances of bypassing it. What these gentlemen have told me is that one third of successful attacks that, that break through Google properties are because of JavaScript URLs. So I, I don't wanna, even though this is one example of how to bypass React, I don't wanna minimize how important of a bypass this is. It's one of the most popular ways to get XSS into a web application um, of, of some kind. I mean, yeah, React is all about updating the DOM. So they know about this threat. They know about JavaScript URLs. I know from the beginning, they made a decision to allow them and it was a conscious decision. They just accepted that people want to be able to do this. But like you're saying, you know, Google's struggling with this. They've built these technologies like trusted types, content security policy, they add defense in depth because they know this kind of stuff slips through either because a library author intends for it to slip through or because it's accidental and it gets introduced into the DOM. So those, those other technologies like trusted types and content security policy are take, worth taking a look at when you just assume that somebody could possibly bypass a mechanism or the, the, in this case, you know, the library maintainers just, just allow it. And to be fair, coming, coming soon to React, and it's the, the PR has already landed, um, they are gonna be warning users, they're already warning users um, in development mode about JavaScript URLs. And then in the future, they, they might be actively blocking JavaScript URLs. So they're super on top of this, the React team is, they just have left it there because it's sort of one of these weird intended functionality things. And that's, that's a big struggle we have with libraries in general right now. I work in the security work group for the Node.js uh, foundation doing ecosystem tri triage on modules that are, have vulnerabilities in the ecosystem. And a lot of the times when a vulnerability gets reported, the maintainer of the library will say, hey, that's intended, right? Like you show them yeah. something like this, you're like, hey, this is a bypass. Obviously the React team doesn't see it that way. They think that's not a bypass, that's intended. And I think that's a controversial stance because if you look at the Angular framework, this is protected automatically. Vue is like, we don't care about it. I don't know if that's true or not. Vue does not defend against this. And the next version of React, there's gonna be a way for this to be, to be handled automatically by the framework. So I know that the React team in the past have said like, oh, it's not our problem. This is the way it's supposed to work. But other modern frameworks, including I believe the next version of React is gonna deal with this automatically, I, I believe. Right. right, yeah. Well, I have a code sample later that we can take a peek at. Um, this is how, actually, I'll, go, I'll jump there now. Why not? Let's jump. Uh, 
Whoa. This is Whoa. how they're planning to deal with it. I'm, is this, is oh. this a good way to deal with the, with the JavaScript protocol URL? No, this is What horrible. are we looking at here, Jim? A, a big freaking regular expression that made me sick to my stomach. I'm, I'm not trying to make fun of the React team. I, I know they're, they're working hard, but this is the absolute effing insane way, wrong way to handle this problem. This is not acceptable. You know, I recently heard that if, I used to say a joke about regex that if you have a problem and you solve it with regex, I had heard that then you have two problems. Yeah, exactly. The new one I heard is that the plural of regex is regrets. Yeah. I'm... But this one, what's the other problem? Besides being a regex, we have to use regex. I'm just joking. But what, what's the what's the problem with this approach? I mean. This is not, see, what I, what I the, the tried and true way to, to handle validation, this is a, essentially an input validation problem. Someone's going to submit a piece of content that we add to a URL context, and I want to restrict certain kinds of content and allow other kinds of URL content. This is not whitelist validation. This is looking to find malicious activity and block it, where I believe the way to really do this is to use the URL class and define which protocols are acceptable, HTTP and HTTPS. Frankly, that's it. Make it configurable if you want and any other protocol gets rejected, this is a real simple and clean way of blocking these bypasses and without having to have this very unmaintainable performance unfriendly blob of regex that no one fully understands. It's just not. Yeah, you know, I tried this at my house. You know, my kids, they're small. I got two small kids and I, I, I would go to the police station every morning and, and print out the wanted posters, you know, and I would bring them home and show them to the kids and I'd say, Hey, if any of these bad people come to the door, don't let them in, but otherwise let everyone else into the house. And my wife said, you know, this might not be the best policy, Ron. You know, instead, maybe <laughs> we show the kids the pictures of, you know, people in the family that we trust and only allow those. So I think an allow list is probably the way you want to go. And you probably don't want to have a deny list like this, like this case. And by the way, I can bypass this with the data URL. Done. I bypassed this and I got XSS to a URL context. That's the other problem. It only solves the JavaScript protocol problem but you can execute untrusted script through a data, the data scheme or data protocol. I don't, I don't know where this is applied. Maybe they handle that case, but what you're, what, what you're saying is you're tempting someone to find a bypass. And oh. we know folks, especially the folks that are working, you know, with Cure 53 and others, they're going to find a bypass, especially for something like this. I, I think so. Do you, can we, do you have a copy of that code that the, 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 the secure react component back in the day? Uh, I might have it around. I'll link it in my blog. It's, it's in one of my blogs. I'll link it in the show notes. No, we're all, all good. Let's charge on. Let's charge on. This is awesome. So let me, let me pop back over here real quick. So you're probably thinking, well, what do you, I, I, that's great. It does escaping, but like sometimes when you write applications, like you actually want to inject yeah. some kind of HTML directly into the DOM. This comes up, right? I, I mean, that's kind of living dangerously if you ask me, but it is an important thing you have to do, Ron. Yeah. So like, what's, what's the current best practice? If I have a chunk of markup and I need to stick it into the DOM, if you're in this situation, Jim, back in the day, what do you do with that markup before you go and, and put it in, in our HTML or something? Well, no, back in the day, as the input hit the server, we would server side as a validation routine, run that HTML user authored input through a server side HTML sanitizer. One of the, and, and the Java ecosystem, there was none back in the day. So that's where Michael Samuel from Google wrote the OWASP Java HTML sanitizer. In the PHP world, there's the HTML purifier class. Ruby on Rails has an HTML native class that does this. Java also has the JSOUP project that does this. Um, Python has the Bleach project, which does, it's all from memory. So, that's, so these are all the different server side HTML sanitizing libraries out there. All of them have been bypassed because this problem is so bleeping com uh, complex. Give me a chunk of, a, a chunk of HTML and, and let's provide some assurance that it doesn't contain malicious JavaScript. And this is, and yet still support all my complicated HTML input. This is a really brutal problem. And, and I think a lot of people even believe doing it server side is not the right place. So just a few years ago, this is where Mario Hydric and the Care 53 team shows up and they, they broke the library, um, you know, Dom Purify. And, and so 
Now, React shows up a couple years ago, and they just did not address this problem. They said, if you want to live dangerously, then use dangerously set inner HTML, and we will let you add whatever markup you want directly to the DOM. And this is insane. Um, it, it, and I think it's bad that the framework itself doesn't address this. But what they did do, to their credit at React, they named this, this attribute dangerously. So we know we're doing something foolhardy. Um, but if you look at Angular, I, I, I'm not a big fan of Angular. I don't like the, the, the complexity of it. I prefer React. But Angular has a built-in HTML sanitizer. I just say it's HTML, and they'll sanitize it automatically using a similar tool. Where React, when I say dangerously set inner HTML, it's raw editing the DOM with markup, and there's no control built into React to help me solve this security problem. I think that's disappointing. I'd like React. So I would say like this thing right here is an escape hatch. That's how I look at it. This is like I, a little escape hatch. I'm a developer. I know what I'm doing. I'm trying to get in the DOM. I want to make changes. I need to get in there and do it. I know what I'm doing. So I'm going to use this particular escape hatch. And like you said, the React team named it dangerously set. So it's obvious to other developers you're doing something dangerous. So if you if you had to do this, Jim, and you had to put this stuff in here using dangerous set inner HTML, what's the control I should be implementing here? What library should I be using to deal with this string? The, the library that has dominated client-side JavaScript-based HTML sanitization is, is a library from the Cure53 team called Dom Purify. This library is so important that it's going to be added to the next version of ECMAScript. It's used on Google's homepage at google.com, and it is, I, I think, one of the most important security libraries in the JavaScript ecosystem because we do this stuff all the time. And like when I go back to old jQuery stuff, it's literally riddled with XSS, and I can use Dom Purify to to plug all of those escape hatches and add an HTML sanitizer to make XSS even on my legacy JavaScript filth fix all that stuff as well. So this yeah, is a this I don't is know a if it, library to modern JavaScript development. Dom yeah, I don't know if the Purify. approach has changed under the hood recently, but I know uh, pretty pretty recently there was a there was an article on Live Overflow's uh, podcast. Oh, he covered uh, somebody had a bypass in this approach. So on Google homepage in their search box, you could put a certain input, and that would result in a cross-site scripting vulnerability when they did DOM manipulation. And it's because of the way that DOM Purify uh, works. I think it's similar to the way that Google mechanism works, which is it creates uh, a template tag, I believe. And then it puts the, the content in that template tag and builds up a DOM. And then it sanitizes and, and removes based on a whitelist of allowed elements and attributes. It removes all the dangerous stuff. And then it takes the output of that DOM fragment and then turns it back into a string and then inner HTMLs that back into your DOM. So there, it's sound, the idea is sound. The problem was there's a slight difference between the way that no script tags were handled uh, in an element tag versus how they're handled in a live DOM. And that little tiny difference was something attackers could exploit. So even Google is dealing with cross-site scripting, uh, DOM-based cross-site scripting because of these types of issues. And even the best in the world, there's still bypasses, so. And I endorse that video. This is from Orange to Sci on Live Overflow. Just go, do a quick search on, on like google.com bypass Live Overflow DOM Purify. And it's and it's it's DOM Purify and Google Sanitizer, basically the same thing. And, and yeah. that is, that, now that bypass was sophisticated and amazing, but to your point, it proves that even when you use the best practice of an HTML sanitizer, client side or server side, you've got to keep those libraries up to date. There's bypasses in them on a fairly regular basis because it's a hard problem to solve, a really hard problem to solve. And you're probably thinking like, okay, dangerous set in our HTML. That's not something people often use, right? I mean, React is all about updating the DOM. Why do I need to jump out through an escape hatch and like, grab some random part of the DOM and update it. So are you familiar with the Signal app, Jim? This is one of the most uh, widely talked about and used messaging apps, especially in the security industry. Their, their claim is it's doing, it's doing some of the best me message communication uh, transport security that's possible with today's cryptographic technology. So it's a real- and, and I'm sure it is a great tool and the cryptography is great. And that's the hard thing about our industry, right? We're flaw finders. So it's hard to talk about things without talking about some of the flaws. Yeah. A lot of great engineering work probably happened there. But, you know, this is a difficult problem that teams grapple with, which is how do you update the, you know, the contents of the DOM? And 
this was the approach that Signal App took. They've now patched it, but they were using React and they were taking the text that they received from the other party. So you're getting a message on Signal, it's a secure communication platform. You're getting a message and they're taking that message and they're taking the text of that message and inserting it directly into dangerously set in our HTML. Wow, that's that's a big deal. And these are like a very security knowledgeable team um, with some of the best best cryptographers I know on the planet in terms of the work they're doing. And they made- So it's hard, right? You end up in these situations where you need to leverage these escape hatches and you go to do it and you try to do the right thing. But in some cases you don't have all the controls in place. So when you're using dangerously set in our HTML, we'll talk about you know using a linter to catch the usage, but really these escape hatches truly are the way that you're going to get this, this DOM-based cross-site scripting into your application. And, and Ron, you know, when you and I think about this, to me, this is easy. If I'm ever going to use a dangerous sync, I use some kind of sanitizing or escaping. But you and I have stared at just the AppSec problem for like a decade now. To the average developer, even secure developers, they're worried about functionality, dates. They're worried about competing in the market. And like security is one of, a, you know, a dozen or more concerns on their mind. This is my, like, only concern. How do I teach secure coding? And, but I, I got to realize that even though it may seem like an easy problem to solve to me, that's not the reality in the world of development. We got to respect that. Yeah. And I mean, in this case, what would be the right approach? I mean, I think would be if you have to use dangerously set in our HTML, which hopefully you don't, hopefully you find another way, um, then you probably should be using DOM Purify. And if you're then using DOM Purify, there might be a bypass. So you probably want content security policy and trusted types layered on top. I agree. And frankly, what I do is I like to do server side sanitization in one library, put that in my database, return that to JSON, and then use DOM purify. So, and turn on CSP. So, if you're going to bypass my stuff, you got to bypass my server side sanitizer, DOM purify, and bypass CSP. Um, and trusted types will back, will back up any sync I don't define, but I'll usually define a dangerous sync to be DOM purify. So again, if you're using a good CSP policy, doing server-side sanitization and client-side sanitization, there's three layers that need to be bypassed. And of course, keep your freaking libraries like righteously up to date on a regular basis. Now we're talking secure software, in my opinion. Yeah, so if we think about dangerously set in our HTML, if you had to guess, Jim, out of the top 100 React component libraries, as far as download goes, how many of these are using dangerously set in our HTML? Do you think out of the top 100, it's two? I didn't look at your, I'm going to guess, I'm a bit more jaded in this world, and I see how often it's used. I'm going to say 40%. 40%. 40%. Okay. I'm it's, it's, I'm making it's 12%. Guess. It's 12%. All right. So all right. 12%, 12 of these libraries need to use this escape hatch. So, so the top 100, 12 of them are using this escape hatch. Right. How, what kind of living is that to you, Ron? What kind of living is that? That's living... <sighs> Dangerous. That's living. I mean, dangerous. it's not like shooting crossbow bolts through the wall of my rental. I just did that. I'm, and it's not a joke. So I was trying to dem cross site scripting. I brought a knife last time, machete to threaten um, Simon. Oliver, you know Simon, right? He's always out of line. You got to wave a knife at him to keep him in line. Are you right? Am I right? Uh, no comment. No comment. <laughs> And so I brought a crossbow to keep Oliver in line, but Oliver is a very respectful gentleman, as we can tell. So like I was demonstrating my, this is from the Society of Creative Anachronisms. I'm an old man, I don't do upfront battle. I do, I shoot at people from far, then I run away, run away, then I shoot crossbow bolts at them. So I was demonstrating the crossbow. This is like old school medieval crossbow with a manual crank and a manual, and that's a real crossbow meant to hit people hard. And I use a safety arrow with the tip and I, I, without thinking, I shot it at the wall. Cause I'm like, it's a safety arrow. And Ron, here's, here's my, here's my, this is my rental. I'm gonna have to get this fixed. Don't worry, lean. I'm gonna fix this. It's my landlady. She's like, you did what to my house? So I put a little hole in there. I'm gonna keep that in there to remind myself to fix it. This is one of the advantages of a virtual session over a podcast. You know, yes, you can't exactly. have you this would... kind of content. Oliver, this wouldn't work on a podcast, right? You're on the bus, podcast. you're listening to this. You can't see the bolt. You can't see the hole in the wall. This Not a webinar. Webinars are stuffy, Ron. This wouldn't work on a webinar. It's too stuffy. This wouldn't work on a webinar either. It's not a but live session. That's improper terminology. It is a what, Ron? It is a... No, live session. No, no, it's not a live session. It's a virtual session. Oh, it's a virtual live session. Vir virtual. I think it's virtual session that happens to be live. Sorry, well, this is live. So back to, back to React. Um, back to React. Okay, so... That, that's the story, right? Dangerous set in HTML, do the right thing. But you know what's interesting is there's another way to get access to the DOM. 
when you're using a React library. And I think this is where we're going to kind of walk away from some of the guidance that people have been seeing since 2015 and start to talk about some of the more modern attack surfaces being discovered. So for example, did you know, Jim, that a ref will give you direct DOM access in React? I knew have you ever heard of that? I knew, refs? I knew props and types will in create component. I didn't know about, tell me about this ref stuff. That's ref stuff is new to me. What's, what's this so, ref so, stuff? About? So refs are like, it's a concept in React where you want to, during some part of the life cycle of your React component, get direct access to the DOM. And here's an example of what you might want to do. You might want to like, when it renders the component, you just want to like take the focus and put it, the browser focus on the input field. So that's benign, right? You're just focusing an input field. That doesn't have a security vulnerability. But where, where this starts to get crazy is I was looking at some open source code recently and I saw somebody doing this with a ref. Ooh. So they're planning to render something and they're saving access, save ref, this dot element equals the current element. So this is the currently rendered element, but this is its DOM, direct DOM API access. And then they're saying, the current element that we're rendering in React, let's run this parse link, which is an auto linker library that takes user input and finds potential links in it. So like if you have a phone number or something that looks like an email address or a URL, it turns it into markup. So let's have this thing auto generate some markup and then let's jam that into the inner HTML property of the element we're about to render. So inner HTML, as you know, that's a script sync. So anything that comes out of this parse link, this props text, this is going to be directly inserted into the DOM and bypass any security controls that React has in place. So, what does parse.link do one more time? I know, so I, know that, does, I know when you're grabbing a prop, that they, they tend to not get auto escaped and so tend this, to get dangerous. This is a third party library, this parse.link. So, this is a third party library that's an auto linker. And what auto linkers do is you give them text and then they give you back text plus markup. So essentially, like, let's say I'm typing to you on Slack and I say, hey, go check out Google.com. It will take that text and then it'll take the Google.com part and turn that into an anchor tag and set its href equal to Google.com. It'll do all that work for me. But typically gotcha. these auto linkers, they don't do escaping. So if I type to you and I put a, you know, a script tag or some other malicious content in the input that I'm sending to you, the auto linker will pass that markup straight through. And won't I apply can, any escaping. I imagine I can get JavaScript URLs through this auto linker as well. You can straight up do image source equals X on alert type. Uh, oh, I got you. scripting. Yeah, got you can do that. Because this is not. Gonna, so they're not doing escaping for the different, the different, the URL and the display sync. They're just not. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I when you look you. at line two, I mean, I'm sure your hands start sweating, right? You're taking something. This dot props dot text. Okay, that should be text we got from the user, and then I'm going to directly insert that into inner HTML somewhere within my React component, that makes me nervous. Like, me I shouldn't be doing that. And not without wrapping the output of parse link and, you know, Dom Purify again or something like that to, to escape the content. So I think that this is a scary, this is a scary usage of, of refs. And I went and looked at the module ecosystem and 61% of the top 100 modules or 61 of them are using refs. Oh. So refs are ultra common where, you know, only a few people are using you know, dangerous set inner HTML, refs are ultra prevalent. So this really increases your attack surface. So if you're on an AppSec team and you're currently linting for dangerously set inner HTML, you might want to add refs to that list. A lot of the usage might be benign, but some of it might be this kind of stuff. That's crazy. And um, sorry, Ron, just to uh, interrupt, we just had a, a, someone in the chat just ask if you can go back into presentation mode. If that's sure. Okay. Thanks so much. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. So, yeah, Jim. So I think that in this case, like, what would the defense be here? If you're going to be using refs like this, you're going to be doing inner HTML. My first reaction is like, when I'm doing link creation, see, I, I, I don't want to just um, purify this. I w I'd rather use a parse.link that, that had security built in, that it did attribute escaping at the attribute level, that did entity escaping at the display data level of an anchor tag or similar and would and would do whitelist validation on the URL type to make sure it was like HTTP or HTTPS only and every other protocol would get dropped. So ideally, I would like that solved at the at the at the link creator. And then if as an extra layer, I can send that link into Dom Purify and that should all get through just fine. So I, I personally want to solve that at two levels. And okay. Or, or, yeah, I think, or, so this, or even better, instead of using inner HTML, 
to assemble the URL programmatically using safe syncs would be another way of doing it. Sure. So that hopefully, I mean, I wish that was the end of the story. I think I wish it was dangerously centered HTML and refs, and that was it for for attack surface. But it turns out that this still exists in React, which is this fine DOM node escape escape hatch. So what this thing does is it gives you direct access to a particular component in the DOM. So if you have this going on anywhere in your in your React components, you're back to straight DOM access. You're back to having to worry about all the different script syncs and all the different escaping issues. And I thought, yeah, go ahead. Is this really needed in JavaScript development? Is this like a programmer being lazy or is this really critical to React development? I think it goes back to what you were talking about, which is a lot of people are coming from jQuery and they're used to having direct DOM access. And I've even seen React components that contain both jQuery code and React code. So they've wow. got some React going on and then they've got some crazy escape hatch stuff going on and they're jumping in there with jQuery. Cause it's like, you use the tools you know. I mean, it'd be great if everybody understood idiomatic React and used hooks or whatever the latest pattern was. But realistically, people are gonna get the job done with what they know how to use. And sometimes <laughs> they know how to do direct DOM access. That's how they know they get the job done. So they're gonna look for these escape hatches. I got you. So I was doing some searches on, uh, on GitHub and I found there's 18,000 results for find DOM node in the open source world. And look at the first example here. They're that doing re find DOM node. Feel pain. I feel pain just looking at that. That's really bad. Immediately, they're starting to concatenate, you know, span, class. I mean, these are static strings, so they're not vulnerable. But I'd say as a code smell, this makes me nervous. You've got people grabbing directly the DOM and immediately looking for inner HTML and then jamming things into it. Um, this is potential to have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. It's also performance unfriendly from UI performance. You're way better doing programmatic creation of components rather than slamming markup into the DOM. It's like this is, it's not just a, I think bad design, but I also think it's bad performance if you really care about client side performance. Yeah. Wow. Hey, all, have okay. you seen this graph before, Oliver? <laughs> this one is, uh, this is the number of React packages, uh, ecosystem packages, uh, and the number of reported vulnerabilities. Uh, so we got the, the, the dark purple here. Do you think we're, we're staying on top of these, these, uh, these vulnerabilities, we're finding them and reporting them? You got to zoom in. You got to zoom Can in. You see it? There's a there's there is a line here. It's it's not. <laughs> it's almost like it's almost the same color as Oliver's uh, jacket there or sweater. Yeah. So so we're I'd say like vulnerabilities in the React ecosystem are underreported, right? So we could use help with this. I found I found some vulnerabilities myself, like I mentioned, and they're not hard to find. They're relatively easy to find. Like here's an example of one that I found. Um, it's a React SVG library, so it's going to take an SVG and it's going to jam it directly into the DOM for you. And it says that any SVG content that contains a script is never going to be run. That's the contract here in the documentation. It says, you use this library, you give me an SVG, that SVG, since it's XML, can have a script tag. I'm going to jam that into the DOM and I'm going to probably use dangerously set in HTML, but you're good because those scripts are never going to execute. And then I went and looked at the source code. What is the source code down here at the bottom saying we're going to do, Jim? Do you see anything about evaluating of scripts there in the source code? It says eval scripts once. <laughs> I feel like this is different than never, right? Like very, very different. Like it, it is an important distinction. It's like, say, Ron, I would never, ever do that ever. Well, maybe just once, but I really, it's <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> Ron, I would never, ever, ever shoot my crossbow in the house. Well, I just do it once a day. I feel like that's different, right? I would never ever hire anybody else to work on an online product for myself. Well, maybe just once. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ron. <laughs> that's a little personal. I'd rather do this alone, or maybe just one time with other people. Just, just once. Okay, I, I, I now get the difference between never and once. I really get it now. Sorry, I have my notes here, and it's not configured in a way. I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily going to present slides today because I, I wasn't sure if this was going to be in a podcast format, but. Here's, here's another vulnerability. Oh, that's I found. not a podcast. We are over this. It's a virtual. I know, I know that. But, but okay, so React Mark Markdown. Here's another library. This is a really common attack surface in React. You want to take some Markdown and then you want to convert it and then you want to take the output, the HTML, and put it into the DOM. Well, one yeah. of the things that people don't know about Markdown is they think that Markdown is like not related to HTML, but it turns out that Markdown is a superset of HTML. Right. So all valid HTML is valid Markdown. So yep. if you pass Markdown through a parser, it's going to come out Markdown, the new elements plus the old elements that were passed in. 
And so for this reason, every place that you go and take markdown output and go and put it into the DOM, you have to do sanitization. And in this case, markdown preview says here at the top, this is the, in their example code, it says that the sanitize option is equal to true. So we're all good from that point of view. They're gonna turn on the sanitizer in the underlying markdown library. They're using to do conversion. But then if we dig a little deeper into their source code, we find this weird fragment at the bottom, these four lines. Five and what this thing is doing is it's creating a new renderer and then it's doing some overriding of the renderer's functionality for when it encounters links. So anytime it encounters an anchor tag during the conversion, instead of running its normal sanitization code, it's gonna do this stuff. What are those plus symbols all about? When it's I pretty, see plus symbols, they freak me out. Are they a string concatenation, right? This is string concatenation, right? So we're gonna be taking user input and doing a little string concatenation. Nope. How often does that lead to cross-site scripting? Like every single time? I mean, that, that <laughs> is cross-site scripting. <laughs> I mean, you could do manual escaping at this level. This is important on a bigger level. A lot of people have told me, well, don't do HTML sanitization. Just use Markdown and this problem goes away. And it does not. There are so many implementation flaws. I can still get certain kinds of script attacks through Markdown conversion. So Markdown does not solve this problem of how to let a user submit rich text to some kind of application. It's got tons of problems like we're looking at right here. Yeah, so this one's just going to take whatever href you gave it and concatenate it in right into the middle of this anchor tag it's building. So as you know, if your href value is set equal to, I don't know, uh, closing double quote and then close this tag and then start a new tag of any kind of tag you want that will insert scripts into the DOM, like an image tag with an on-air attribute or whatever, you've got cross-site scripting here. We, we could fix this if we, again, ran the href variable through an attribute escaping function, which does exist in JavaScript, and then run that through a URL protocol parser, which makes sure it was only a legal scheme like HTTP or HTTPS. We could lock this down, but this is, this is dangerous code that I would not expect to see in a markdown conversion library at all. And again, these two vulns, I actually found about six vulnerabilities when I was doing the research for you back in 2017, and I reported them through various reporting channels. And these were the two that got kind of remediated or at least acknowledged by the maintainers. The other ones went into this weird void where you're just kind of waiting for a reply from the maintainer and you haven't publicly disclosed it. And they, they kind of, you know, so they, they're still in some in limbo, right? And I found these vulnerabilities, you know, in a couple of afternoons. And I think that if more people were looking at these uh, 65,000 modules, uh, we'd be able to uncover a lot more vulnerabilities. So I hope that by showing these examples of how simple these vulnerabilities are to find, that um, so folks that are obviously better researchers than I am, because that's actually not my, you know, exploit research is not my background. But if you're you know, happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's really, really talented people that know how to do this stuff. And gotcha. hopefully they don't hack me. Um, and I think that, you know, they could, they could go and look at these libraries and they could, they could uncover probably hundreds and hundreds of vulnerabilities. And I, there's some tools out there that are trying to help us with this. Uh, for example, I know that GitHub recently released a tool um, around their ecosystem security module. It uses CodeQL. It's based on Semly. They, you can do analysis of a single project. If you write a rule, a, a rule checker in this CodeQL language, you can could, you could analyze a single repository for a flaw. And then you can upload that CodeQL in some way to, to GitHub and then they'll run it across more code bases and award bounties. So the idea is that you're not just finding one-offs, you're finding patterns, and then you're writing something in a pattern language like a linter or CodeQL that's gonna catch things across the entire ecosystem. And these guys are to see, they're developing an, uh, a platform for this as well. I've worked with them a little bit um, in their beta period for their platform. And this thing gives you the ability to run analysis using rule sets like ESLint type rule sets across a large group of, um, NPM modules. So the idea being that, you know, you don't just find one vuln when you're looking for something, but you find a class of vulns, and then that runs across the ecosystem of modules and, and uncovers, you know, all the instances of that type. I know that you did some, some early work on like static code analysis engines, Jim. This is like generally the idea, right? You, you write a check and then from there that, that, that runs across your whole code base. Right. You're basically taking, you're, you're grabbing the code, converting it to some kind of abstract syntax tree and then running linters or rules throughout that tree to discover to discover obvious vulnerability problems. Usually you're not doing it directly against the source. 
but against like a like some kind of compiled version of it so it's a standardized form but you, all the same stuff and like the real the real work of static analysis is not the conversion to some to some format like an ast the real the real work is building this huge library of linters and rules to find these problems and that requires very specialized knowledge. It's really hard to get researchers to write rules of this of this nature. This is yeah, and I think what a lot of these AppSec teams that I know with React Pets have been doing is they can't find a, a static code analysis tool that can fire up their React app and do the flow analysis and the source to sync and put the taints in and all this complex stuff. Instead, they're just writing really simple linters. And so this is kind of like, this is kind of the bread and butter of DevSecOps or AppSec automation, as Jim calls it, or you just call it automation, right, Jim? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about CICD, right? Continuous yeah. integration, continuous development. I just call yeah. it, I the term automate security checks is usually right? what developers actually understand the most in my experience. Let's automate those security checks. So I think, you know, whenever I tell a, a, a group to an AppSec group, hey, maybe you should be linting for dangerously set inner HTML or usage of props or deserialization of state. They say like, I can't block the build, right? I can't put the stuff into our pipelines because it'll block the build. But the more sophisticated teams, they just send these results to themselves. You don't necessarily have to block the build and tell the developer about it. If you have a, a small AppSec team or even just a security focused person on the development team, you can send these alerts to them and they can kind of triage and handle them out of band. So just because these kind of checks occasionally produce a false positive, I don't think that's a reason to just completely discount using linters. I mean, ideally, linters will will not contain false positives, but and these are this super effective. It's so simple to write these. It's it doesn't require the complexity that we see in static analysis development. It's something we can build into the pipeline easily, and it's something that a lot of developers are familiar with working on. So even if we're we can use them at the appsec level, but we can creep these linters up into developers' IDE and developers' world. I think a lot more naturally. Than trying to get them to use static analysis as part of their daily build. So this is something very powerful in my opinion. And, and we're, I know we're sort of getting to the end of the hour here, but I, I'll link the I'll link some good linters in the show notes that I use for React. Awesome. And then I would also like to mention, like when you're selecting uh, React component libraries, there's some indicators like low download count, no README, lots of PRs open, lots of issues open in the repo. And I think a gentleman uh, at Sneak wrote a, a NPM module called NPQ. Uh, Lear and Tall wrote this module and it actually quality checks your module for you in an automated way. So you could basically type that command or alias NPM to that command. And when you do the install, you get a report back that tells you about the quality of the module and it'll actually prompt you about whether or not you want to install it. So if you really want your developers to be, uh, you know, taking a double consideration about whether or not to install a component from the ecosystem, possibly NPQ could be a solution to that. I think that, you know, obviously you want to run things like NPM audit. We all run NPM install and we know that NPM audit gives us findings. Um, I know Sneak has some similar tooling around finding of vulnerabilities in the ecosystem. Um, but, you know, we really need those vulnerabilities to have been reported in order for them to show up uh, in those scans. So you can't, you can't find out about a vulnerability if no one's reported it. In this case, with React, we've only got five reported vulnerabilities. So the effectiveness of running, you know, any audit tool is going to be kind of low, right? if it's based on you know, known vulnerabilities. Exactly. We need the researchers to do a lot more work of the JavaScript ecosystem. So our, our tooling is gonna be more effective basically is what you're saying. And I feel that way. I mean, I feel like you, know, you could have a great tool like NPM audit or sneaks audit tool, but if there's only five vulnerabilities in the database or eight or 10 or whatever it is out of the 65,000, yeah. it's not gonna be that effective. I think the real solution, Ron, is that any JavaScript developer who has a new library to NPM should be banned from development for at least a year. No, no, that's not that's not fair. That's not, that, that's just, never mind. Just, just just ignore that for a moment. And what I guess one final note that of something that's happening in the React ecosystem is the Next.js library is becoming very popular. And I think that Next.js it allows you to do server side and client side rendering, just like React does. But it promotes oh. server side rendering, and they've created some lifecycle hooks that run server side which means that now your React component libraries also contain server-side vulnerabilities. Yeah. So we're starting to see React components that do like direct, direct SQL access on the server side or do command line uh, calls. So if, if you're currently, you know, you have some linters in place, you're doing some security automation for React and you are thinking about client-side vulnerabilities, which historically has been the problem with React components, it might be worth taking a look and uh, seeing if you also are vulnerable to some server-side vulnerabilities. 
when it comes to your React components. That's, I think those are the thoughts I had to share today. I, I know we're getting close to time here. Do you have anything else, guys? Ron, I'm really impressed with your research. You really are one of the, the deepest React security thinkers I know of, period. And uh, keep up the great work. And uh, I'm just really grateful that you took time to do this, do this, not a podcast or a webinar, but a virtual session with us. You're awesome, Ron. Thank you so thanks. much. For this. No, thank you, Jim. And thanks, Oliver, for hosting us. And Sam, I know she's around the corner. So thank you very yeah. much for doing this. Thank you so much, guys. Um, again, a great and, and very entertaining uh, session. Jim, I hope you don't get in too much trouble. Uh, <laughs> if anybody too. knows of a good contractor in the Northern, <laughs> Northern Virginia area, please contact me at jim at manicode.com. Looking for a contractor who can fix a little hole in the wall. I know it can be done. So if you know a we'll good see. contractor, let me know, please. Again, yeah, feel free to drop any recommendations in the, in the uh, Slack channels and we'll pass them along to Jim. Um, so thanks everyone who's uh, joined us live today. And again, if you're listening uh, to the recording as well, thanks for listening along. Um, the next session that we have is in two weeks time, uh, same time uh, as this session. And it will be with developer advocate Sam Bellin from Ortho, who's going to be talking about authenticating single page apps using JSON web tokens. So hopefully awesome. that will be a, another very entertaining session. And the recording will be up on mydevsecops.io very shortly. And once again, if anyone has any questions after this session, please feel free to drop them into Slack. Uh, both Jim and Ron are in there. You can feel free to tag them or we can pass them along to you. And with that, we're going to say thanks, everyone, uh, for attending the session today. And we hope you all have a good rest of the day, wherever you might be. So thank, thank you. you and we'll see thank you again you. soon. Thanks, guys.